All right, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to our, our panel, The Economics of the Cutting Edge. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Harry Surden. I'm on the faculty here at the University of Colorado Law School, and I have the pleasure of moderating this panel. Um, so the panels today have been largely focused on uh, contemporary issues of uh, privacy and economics. Um, so on this panel, we're going to delve into the always perilous undertaking of looking into the future uh, concerning economics and privacy. We're going to query changes in the relatively near term, and I mean that by the next uh, five to ten years, uh, whether changes change the analytical framework in any degree from an economics and private perspective. We're going to look at it along three separate dimensions. The first dimension are emerging technologies, technologies that have uh, really yet to emerge. Uh, another dimension is uh, more prevalent or more intensive use of existing technologies that are currently being used today. And then the final dimension is forthcoming changes in regulatory contexts in the near term. So we've got a uh, fantastic panel joining this, and due to limited time, I won't go much into their bios, but I encourage you to look at them further online, and as the panel uh, composition has changed much, uh, changed to some degree since the printing, but let me briefly introduce them, uh, just so you know who we have here. Uh, to my left, we have Peter Swire from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Uh, next to Peter, we have Fernando LaGuarda from Time Warner Cable. Next to Fernando, we have Chris Hoofnagel from the UC Berkeley Law School. Next to him is my colleague Scott Pepit, as who you've encountered from the University of Colorado Law School. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Baron Soka from the uh, Tech Freedom. Um, so um, let me set the context a little bit uh, by posing a question, which I hope that the panel can answer. So if, if indeed this panel is about the cutting edge of privacy uh, in terms of economics and technology and future changes, uh, looking down the road in the near future in the one to five year time frame or a little bit beyond that, are there particular technological advancements that are poised to emerge, if not widespread already, or that are poised to become so widespread of currently incipient or different uh, more intensive uses of existing technology that pose new and relatively important issues relating to privacy and economics that are worth proactively devoting attention today. And to answer that, let me initially throw this out to uh, Scott Pepit, whose uh, research delves in that area, and then I will uh, throw it out to the larger panel for comment. Um, okay, so I'm going to do the, the sort of fun thing, but also dangerous thing of trying to peer around the corner. Um, Harry has asked me to give a blistering tour of some technologies, and the danger, of course, is if I go up too far out, then you'll all say, well, that's just crazy talk and so speculative that it's not worth worrying about. And if I stay too close to the present, then you'll all say, well, I already knew that, and that's boring. So I'm going to try to um, give you some examples. And since we've heard a lot today about tracking technologies and advertising technologies, I'm not going to focus on those. Um, I'm going to just do some others, and I'm going to talk really fast. Um, so I'm going to go through two different things that I just think are worth focusing on. One are ways to connect digital identity and physical identity, and one are ways to connect physical space and digital space. Um, and it's really the combination of all of these at the same time that causes some interesting um, effects. And the caveat, of course, number three there is, I mean, who knows, right? Of course, who knows what happens um, next. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was giving a presentation. I put up this slide. I, I had to fake this slide. Google goggles really wouldn't do that. Um, and everybody laughed and said, ha ha, that's really funny um, that Google goggles could um, just take a picture of me and pull up my name. But it's only a year plus later. And even though we knew um, at the time that Google goggles actually probably could do that and it just hadn't been turned on yet, we now really know that facial recognition is no longer something just to speculate about. Um, Facebook has paired up with Face.com, which is building or has built this just enormous database of faces. Um, Apple bought Recognizer from uh, Polar Rose, which is a facial recognition technology that plays around with apps like this, where your smartphone just 
hovers icons around someone's head in a meeting, you know, that th there's their Twitter feed, um, right, superimposed on their image. Um, and Alessandro, uh, this is my go-to privacy story at the moment when somebody says, I don't really get why you're talking about informational privacy. I just talk about Alessandro's recent study. It's been well publicized. I hope you've all um, heard about it, but it's just wonderful, right? So you take uh, your smartphone, you write a little app that uh, works on the smartphone, you point it at Harry, you go up to the Facebook uh, uh, data set of all the public um, pictures and names, and you compare Harry's picture to what you see there, and Alessandro, using um, uh, a facial recognition platform, can find Harry or figure out that it's Harry, um, you know, roughly one out of three times if I'm getting the numbers right. And then he can do this really nasty thing next, which is he can guess five digits of, of Harry's social security number um, just to show one of many predictive things he might be able to do now that he knows that it's Harry. If this terrifies, uh, here's uh, an image from Alessandro and, and colleagues, I should say, it's not your study alone, but um, where he pulls someone up and in the upper right of that third image you can see the, per the, the beginning of the guess of the social security <coughs> number. If this freaks you out, um, there are things you can do. Um, you, you, you can try to, um, to confuse Alessandro, but it won't work all that well and I'm not sure if this is fashionable yet or not. Um, so facial recognition is just, it's not coming, it's here, it's just a question of deployment and norms and regulation and markets. Where do we find value in this and where do we push back? Um, it's the same with iris. I thought iris technology was way out in the future. Your iris is, um, whereas your fingerprint has about nine unique identifying points in it, your iris has over 2,000 and your two irises are different. So it's just an unbelievably helpful um, and unique uh, bio uh, identifier. Um, uh, I'm channeling Jeff Carter, who I'm sort of replacing on this panel because Jeff wasn't able to come uh, because of a, uh, an illness in his, in his family, is my understanding. But Jeff invited me out, um, I don't know, earlier this year. I flew out to New York to look at their iris technology. It's just completely baffling if you didn't know that this technology was as far along as it is. Um, this is a, uh, what they call their H-Box. It's like a gateway. You walk through it. Um, after being registered in his system, which took about 10 seconds, I could go through this um, at a run with my eyeglasses on and it would pick me up and identify me from my iris. This is not what you think of, I have to go stare into a thing, you know, and it might be able to figure me out. Um, this is a pretty amazing high throughput device. Um, and then they scale them. They have all these littler versions of these things. Uh, this is like the really little version. It's freaky. It sits next to a doorway. And just as you walk up to the doorway, the door unlocks. Um, this is incredibly helpful. Uh, been deployed in financial services firms in particular. If you think about running a bank, you've got to secure thousands, tens of thousands of entry and e exit points. Um, you do this, it's really useful. And now what they've got is in a USB stick uh, that can um, plug into your computer. They're already talking to smartphone manufacturers about putting this device in your smartphone so the thing doesn't let anybody use it except you. Um, this is not, you know, five years from now. This exists. I actually used one of these USB devices. It's pretty cool. Um, and they have just an, a baffling array of applications that they're already deploying, um, including they're playing with, at, well, and, and Lior spoke this morning about what India is doing. Um, iLock is, uh, is deploying as a test case in Mexico in a city where they're putting iris recognition in, on every bus, in every ATM machine, in every restaurant. You don't need your wallet anymore. They just know where you are and who you are, and that's how you pay for everything. And when asked to Jeff, why, why would anyone do this? Why would you sign up? This is his answer. When you get masses of people opting in, opting out doesn't really help. Opting out puts more of a flag on you than being part of the system. We believe everyone will opt in. Um, right, you know, welcome to, uh, to some of the threat there. Um, biometric and other sharing. So this is just a whole another category of, of interesting current technology that's starting to have some privacy and implications. We love um, all this new cool measurement technology. So this is a thing you can put in your car. It will record all sorts of data about what you're doing in your car. I mean, I don't really mean it that way, but um, how you're driving your car, um, speed, time of day, uh, engine, braking patterns, banking, how quickly you're turning. 
Um, and boy, it's not hard. Uh, quickly, you start to see insurance companies saying, okay, we'll give you a discount if you install this chip into your car, which broadcasts through the internet back to them. This is a teenage driving monitoring device that also gets you a discount on your insurance. Um, you can easily imagine how this starts to plug into health um, insurance uh, with the proliferation of uh, biometric um, health monitoring uh, devices that talk automatically up to, this, to the internet. Um, your scale can now broadcast your weight for you to your friends and have its own Twitter feed, which is pretty cool. Um, if you're trying to commit yourself that you're going to lose weight, you can get a scale that tells your friends how you're doing. Um, and lots of the really nifty innovations this year, Fitbit, Jawbone, some of the stuff you've probably played with or seen. Um, I order all this stuff when it comes out just to see what it's going to do. You start to imagine where those biometric data go and who will find them useful. Um, the measuring of the self is entertaining, but it's also economically a gold mine. There are lots of people who are firms who want this data and you will be incentivized to share it with them or they will be incentivized to find it. The last is smarter goods. I think it's another way we have to think about identity. Goods are starting to broadcast their digital identity. This I found in a, a local um, uh, uh, outdoor supply store. It was a cool, like, nice sort of looking, Icelandic kind of looking sweater. It had a unique um, identifier on it. You scan the unique identifier with your smartphone and it tells you here, here's an example, and it tells you exactly where in New Zealand the sheep was. Um, and you can investigate the farm and their ethical practices um, about that particular sweater. Uh, I have a can of soda up in my office that has a QR code on it that will tell you, it's like a coffee drink. It will tell you which farmer in Africa grew the coffee. Um, this is a level of interaction with digital identity of goods that we're not quite um, familiar with. And then last, and uh, I'll, I'm going to speed up if you can imagine, um, in the second category, so that's always to tie digital identity and physical identity, and you start adding those together as Alessandro has shown, and it gets really weird really fast. Um, ways to tie digital, digital space and physical space. Um, I'm just going to do two. One is AR. You all know what augmented reality looks like, right? It's called the, 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 the yellow line in football. Um, but We've moved a long way from the, the, the you know, uh, 60s where we were playing with visual um, uh, information being superimposed on your physical experience. The reality is we've all got an augmented reality device now. It's called your smartphone. That market has exploded. Um, but it's pretty crude still, right? I mean, Yelp is really annoying. I don't know how many people actually like using the augmented reality Yelp app. It's not very fun. But who cares, right? This is 2011. Then 2012, they're going to break this out of your smartphone. That's what they want. That's what we want to do. These are some of the some of the ideas. So, for example, they're playing with imprinting digital information directly on your windshield. Why should you be looking down at a, an LCD display when you can just look out the windshield and see where you're going? And there's lots of other things they're talking about putting on your windshield. Um, and of course, the holy grail for augmented reality folks is to get you out of your smartphone and into your, into your eyeglasses. Um, again, I gave a talk about this recently, and I showed this as, you know, this is kind of the cutting edge of what this looks like and who in the world would want to wear those. And then this week, the same company came out with a new version of these that I actually can imagine wearing. They look like, they are Oakley glasses with clear lenses that are able to project digital information onto the lenses that happened four days ago. Um, nobody can figure out how much they cost, of course. Um, but, you know, Alessandro and I were laughing last night. I also put this up in the talk. There is a researcher in Seattle, uh, Seattle University, who's come up, has put an LCD um, uh, display into a contact lens, and then you told me last night, and there's one in New Zealand, or uh, Japan, who's also put the ability for your contact lenses to have radio connectivity. Um, so this is, you know, again, I, it's hard. Am I just speculating? Sure, but it's not like we're not actually trying to develop this stuff. We are, and of course, this changes a lot about your experience of reality. This is a way to bring digital information, all that stuff from the first category into your experience. And finally, and here I promise I'm almost done, if you haven't seen the Sixth Sense video, um, Pranav Mystery Sixth Sense TED Talk, you should go watch it. It'll just blow your mind if it hasn't already a couple of times. Pranav builds this little thing, it costs $300. It's a camera, a smartphone, and a projector, a little Pico projector that he hangs from around his neck. And what it lets him do is walk around the world and interact with digital information in physical space in a completely different way. He wants to make a call, he just projects his 
um, his keypad on his hand and dials, and it talks to his smartphone and dials. But this also changes the interaction with physical objects. You can't see it because of the slide, but what he's, if you could see it, his Pico projector has identified, or his camera has identified the book. His smartphone has gone to Amazon and gotten reviews, and his Pico projector is projecting onto the cover of that book five stars from Amazon while he's standing in the bookstore. Um, similarly, this is, Aless <laughs> this is Alessandro plus Pranov Mystery, right? You get this really weird, okay, I'm just, I can't remember my students' names, but I don't need to, um, because, um, because Alessandro will rec recognize them, match them to Facebook, and then Pranov will project their names right in front of me. Um, this works, this is not a joke, this, I, he can do this. Um, and similarly, in terms of uh, transactions and the way markets are being affected by this, imagine you're standing in the store, you're trying to decide between two kinds of paper towels. For Pranav, it's a very different choice. He goes and picks up the bounty, um, and his uh, system projects onto the roll of paper towels those three circles and a yellow dot that says this is an environmentally suspect brand. You shouldn't buy this. Um, he tries the other one, um, and it says, yeah, that gets a green light. Uh, this is better according to the criteria you've predefined in the system. Um, these are all just mashups of different kinds of technologies uh, that all together start to have pretty interesting implications. And I went over. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, th thank you, Scott, for that. Uh, peek into the future and really it's not futuristic as Scott has indicated. These are all technologies that uh, either are available effectively now or in the near term. So setting the context, let me throw this out to the, the panel. Uh, assuming that there might be new technologies arriving, arising in the uh, near term out of this or other emerging technologies and more intensive uses of technologies uh, and assuming further that uh, some of these issues need addressing, do, do we as the panel find uh, there are particularly effective means of addressing these issues? Now I'm thinking there could be a variety of ways that we could address this. Uh, we could employ market mechanism, <coughs> market industry, uh, industry standards, market disciplines or certifications, government mechanisms, either direct, indirect regulation, ensuring robust competition or neutral platforms requiring transparency, some sort of hybrid systems, uh, social norms even, technological solutions or combinations thereof. I think all of these have been used to greater to lesser degrees. I want to see if uh, the panel has any opinions about uh, what's the most effective approach. So let me throw it up to Baron first. Uh, okay, well, let me start by saying that I, I think this is really, well, the debate that you see play out about this is a debate that uh, on one poll is best articulated by Larry Lessig in his 1999 book Code, where he says, left to itself, cyberspace, and I think he means generally technology, and it would include all of these things, that cyberspace will become a perfect tool of control. So that is the dystopian fear that I think um, encapsulates a lot of what people find troubling about these technologies. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, the Supreme Court a year later in the USV Playboy case, Justice Kennedy wrote uh, in the context of striking down uh, censorship of um, a private cable signals and preferring an opt-out system over an opt-in system, said that technology expands individual capacity to choose and it denies the potential of this revolution if we assume the government is best positioned to make these choices for us. So on a high philosophical level, I think that's the debate. Um, does technology empower or enslave? And I think uh, obviously the organization uh, that I represent today is Tech Freedom. We chose our name advisedly because we believe very strongly in Justice Kennedy's vision of technology as empowering and that we already have a system of information, a baseline system of information control in this country and it is the First Amendment. And Eugene Volokh put this best in his uh, 2000 uh, paper on that, that that is our framework for dealing with, with these problems. Now, th that framework is not a framework that is simply laissez-faire. It doesn't mean that there isn't a role for <coughs> government. Um, on a high level, uh, when we're talking about speech, and most of what we are talking about here is speech, and we'll get into this a little more, uh, Peter and I, I'm sure, in discussing the Sorrell case, um, but what we're talking about is restricting the gathering of data, the processing of data, and the observations that we make about the world, and analytics uh, about how we understand how everything in the world around us works. Because all of those technologies we just talked about depend in some way on that process of observation uh, and analysis. 
Um, and so just very briefly put, my, my conceptual framework is essentially the, the one that we already have under the First Amendment, which is government has an important role to play in punishing fraud and deception. Those things are not protected as speech. And that's uh, why we have the Federal Trade Commission doing what it does. And to make a, um, a long story short, I think that the FTC could do a much better job than it's doing today. I'm not here to defend the status quo in particular, but to ask how we can make that system work better. And among many other things that could be done, I think it's really appalling that the FTC didn't have a chief technologist until just a few years ago, and that it has such a small technical staff. And so to me, it's really kind of silly that we're having this whole conversation about whether we need new legislative authority and we need to have a new framework for dealing with this when we haven't really given the tools to the agency that's responsible for enforcing the existing uh, regime. The second thing that we can do under the uh, world as I see it of uh, the First Amendment is government can validly compel disclosure of objective factual statements. We have a doctrine about this, and to make a long story short, it says that uh, government can validly force you to say what's in your product, what your practices are, anything that is a, a fact. Uh, as opposed to, uh, for example, this product is or is not appropriate for people under the age of 18, which is a subjective assertion. And uh, I can talk more about this, but briefly I would say this is what Cass Sunstein is doing at OIRA, and this has been at the heart of his work for many years, is arguing for uh, not transparency in the sense that we have known in the past, but a really radical and robust form of transparency, which he generally refers to as smart disclosure, which is the idea that disclosures to consumers, as well as by government, should be made in structured formats. And I think the key to understanding the power of this is understanding that when we, this conversation we've had today about disclosure and whether it works effectively really for the most part presumes that we're talking about um, a form of disclosure where the disclosure is the interface for the user. And technology, and this is I think the kind of thing that Justice Kennedy meant when he said that technology empowers us to choose, technology today is such that um, in fact we have what I would call a, a two-part or two-sided disclosure. So just imagine that Instead of having the nutrition labels that we have on the back of products today where government says you must disclose the following 10 variables and they all appear in the label, you instead have a system where government says you must disclose the following dozens of, of uh, pieces of data. They go into a structured data format that is unreadable by the average user. But technology, just as you saw in that augmented reality uh, labeling system, provides an interface for users, whether it's through something like that or my scanning a QR code on any product in the world and then pulling up on an app on my phone an interface that parses that raw data and interprets it for me and, and interprets it for my values and whether I'm allergic to peanuts or MSG or care about fat or whatever that might be. That vision of uh, what, I would, what I would call robust and meaningful transparency is a powerful one. It's one that could become ultimately actionable when those tools become tools in the online context that allow me to block data disclosure um, practices that I don't like. That is, in, in a sense, what was stillborn of P3P in the past and what I, I am optimistic about in the future. Uh, and then finally, uh, I would say that my, my framework for dealing with these is to look for marginal improvements to the existing system. So it is to say that um, under even, even strict scrutiny, it's not that government can't do anything, but that if government can prove that it has a whether it's a strict or a compelling interest, depending on what your level of scrutiny is, and we can talk about that. If there is a real problem and government can come up with a narrowly tailored solution, government can intervene. And I'll give you an example of that that uh, was alluded to earlier today when the, um, the debate came up about, uh, about uh, the analogy to chemicals and, and that you could, um, you could re-identify data just as you could turn a um, harmless chemical back into a harmful chemical. Well, if that indeed is the problem, we could, as Jane Yakowitz uh, at Brooklyn Law School has proposed, one valid form of government intervention would be to say, here are the best practices. Here are the minimum requirements for safe and proper de-identification of data. And if you meet these, whatever they might be, your use of that data would be subject to lower uh, regulatory burdens. And if you don't meet those practices, we will, we will subject you to higher burdens because that data has not been safely identified. That's the kind of intervention that I think would be very much consistent with the First Amendment, consistent with my way of looking at the world, but it's one that again requires government to identify real problems and look for uh, narrowly tailored solutions and, generally speaking, defer to what would be less restrictive alternatives. And that would be things like user empowerment tools, uh, limiting government's access to information, which tends to be the most clearly defined harm in this debate, which often gets left out, as well as enforcing existing laws, um, as we've already discussed, 
uh, and most importantly, consumer education. So we, we've talked a lot today about whose job it is to educate consumers about privacy and how to deal with it. Uh, I, I live in the world of ranking alternatives, and to me, it's a much um, less odious thing for government to be in the business of funding and supporting awareness building programs than for government to be in the business of enforcing what amounts to a precautionary principle about dealing with new technologies. So, so what, what I'm hearing from you is a limited role for government and a sort of optimism in using technological approaches to dealing with emerging uh, privacy and technology. Yeah, and let me, if, I, I don't want to go too long, let me add two things quickly to that. Yeah. The first thing is to say that uh, since we're here to talk about the economics of privacy, yeah. I think we should all remember what Hayek said about the job of economics being to demonstrate to men how little they understand about what they imagine they can design. And his point was to say that economics should be a discipline that is that begins from uh, not hubris, but a, a, a profound limit, uh, recognition of the limitations of human knowledge and rationality. And that is most of all true when we're dealing with new technologies. Um, I think Demsetz, in his work on uh, building on Coase's work about cost, he, he developed the original work about why we allocate property rights in the way we do. He, he explains why this uh, ultimately has to do with economic efficiency, and he warns us in the 1960s that um, allocating property rights, which is essentially what we're talking about here today when we talk about setting rules through law, uh, they are a sort of quasi-property right. He's, he warns us to be very, very careful about uh, allocating those property rights uh, under regimes of uncertainty. So when we don't know what the consequences are of our regulation, what the costs are to not only the businesses involved, how we fund media, for example, but innovation as well as free speech, uh, as well as political free speech, I think we should be very cautious. So, so let, me, let me just stop you right there because I want it, this to be a larger discussion uh, and throw this out to the rest of the panel. Any reactions either to Barron's uh, view of uh, technological optimism or other approaches for dealing with uh, emerging technologies and privacy that have historically proven to be accurate or helpful? I'm happy to jump in here. I, I've been an advocate in recent years of the idea of competition enhancing enforcement. The idea that we could have enforcement actions that would make it easier for consumers to make smarter decisions or decisions more in line with their preferences uh, let me give some examples. Um, I, other than Alicia, I've probably read more privacy policies than anyone in this room. I've read thousands of them in doing empirical studies at, at Berkeley. And one of the things you see frequently in these uh, privacy policies is a very assertive upfront statement that the company does not share information with third parties that is later retracted in some way. And my favorite example um, is AnnTaylor.com. And despite the fact that I've been talking about this for two years, they haven't fixed it. It's worth going to look at. Um, it, literally, the, when you get to the third party information sharing section, it says, we do not share information with third parties. Three sentences later, it says, we share information with specifically chosen marketing partners. Well, what does that mean? And I, I think for, just from, from thinking about market approaches to these problems, the first thing we have to do is agree that certain words mean certain things. So we need to say that sharing also means sale or rental, and we have to define third party versus affiliate versus special sister company, et cetera. Um, so that is, doesn't even get to the problems that people can't uh, understand privacy policies and all that, all that mess. Um, uh, a lot of my work looks at the, the problem of <coughs> how people understand privacy protections. And so Joe Turo and I have done a series of studies where we've shown that most Americans, when they see that a website has a privacy policy, they believe that that website can't sell data to third parties. And they also believe that there's all sorts of laws in place uh, to protect themselves. And the perverse part of that research shows that the people who know the rules um, if you look at people who care about privacy, the people who, who are on the high, um, um, the high privacy concern scale, they know the rules. And the people who say, oh, I don't care, are precisely the people who don't know the rules. So there is a bit of this feedback loop problem. Uh, let me just mention um, uh, three other things that I think could increase competition in this field. Um, one is we have to have an enforcement action that basically says that consumers uh, excuse me, that businesses cannot force tracking on upon consumers. 
I've showed in two different studies that advertisers deliberately use unknown te uh, technologies that cannot be blocked by consumers in order to track them, in order to prevent those consumers from uh, blocking cookies and engaging in other types of uh, off of obfuscation. And I, I think where we're going is with fingerprinting. You know, there's, there's actually, there's, there's uh, the people who are doing this tracking do not see people as individuals. They see them as objects. They don't think they should be able to opt out. Um, you get them in a closed room and they say, we don't think people should opt out. Um, and, and these are all the different reasons why. And we're gonna start using fingerprinting and we're gonna use it outside the security area. We're gonna start using it in a marketing area. Um, so I, I think we need an enforceable way to say no to tracking. Um, and one, that, one that basically says to uh, businesses that if a consumer has manifested this intent, you can't use tricks to, to uh, undo their, their preference. Two other things I'll mention real quickly. Um, opting out, um, you know, a lot of people wrote about uh, the problem that it, it opt out systems place all sorts of incentives uh, to, to uh, block the opt out process. So businesses have incentives to make it hard to opt out. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, areas where I've been working is um, uh, privacy agents, companies you literally pay in order to opt you out of various data broker services and the like. And it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, th those, uh, those companies face a lot of challenges. One of the challenges they face is they go to big data brokers and say, I want to opt out my client base here. And that data broker says, no, we don't believe that you um, represent these clients. We think you might be lying. We want to have the chance to talk to those individuals directly, um, et cetera. So they're increasing transactional costs in the opt-out field. Um, I think that's worth looking at. And uh, one of the reasons why it's worth looking at is this, this idea that these companies should have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you before you opt out is um, a product of this weird belief that people actually want this stuff, that people actually want this advertising. They want it so so badly you can't trust them to opt out. Um, it'd, be nice, um, it'd be nice to be able to go to a company and actually pay them and, and have an effective relationship so they could uh, let you avoid some of this stuff. Peter, did you have a reaction? I, I, have a, I could have a lot of points. I'll just make one point. Um, Today's our economics of privacy, but I go to a lot of conferences where the word security or cybersecurity is used, and I don't think that's been mentioned today. Um, it's relevant to looking at the uh, list that Scott gave in a really compelling visual way. So um, biometrics, um, we can start to have our fingerprints or our iris scans used a lot of places. Um, and then if it's used at a, just a taco stand, some place that doesn't keep very good security, they can release the very clear digital copy of my finger it's really hard to get a new finger, right? So the rest of your life, the rest of your life, the pattern in your finger is out there, and it, social security numbers, you can get a new one. Credit cards, you can get a new credit card number. Biometrics, a lot harder. That's one kind of risk. The, the risk the other way is on irises is, I've got a really, really high quality way to get around the iris scan. I take a picture of it, I put it over my irises. And, you know, event, there are countermeasures. They can try to measure whether I have some, something over my irises and stuff. But, but the point is that, that there's a tax for each one of these scenarios and that the company that's selling the biometric stuff never tells you about the attacks. And that with biometrics in particular, once it's lost, it's very hard to figure out what people do with their fingerprint once it's compromised. Thank you. Well, uh, continuing with this theme of uh, changes both in technology and regulatory changes and governmental changes, Upcoming, and I, I'd like to pose a question uh, to Peter again. Uh, the Supreme Court last summer oh, okay. issued the uh, decision in Sorrell versus IMS Health, and I know that you've uh, suggested that this decision, read broadly, might have some significant implications on the economics and uh, ability of privacy regulation. Okay. Uh, if you could say a little bit about that. Right. And do we get this? Yeah, there it is. Uh, so uh, this is the paper. Uh, I'm going to do about a six, seven minute version of a paper. Um, what if data really, really equals speech and gets all the First Amendment uh, speech protections? We'll see. So here's what the winning lawyer in the Supreme Court case said uh, after uh, the case. This case casts serious doubt on either privacy or economics, which is basically everything today, as a justification for any law aimed at stopping targeted or behavioral marketing. Now, you know, it could just be a, like an advocate for a position, but he's the guy who just won in the Supreme Court 
where he was the lead trial lawyer and, and part of the team. And so what, what does this mean? What really would happen if we have a doctrine? And I'm not here saying it will necessarily be what the Supreme Court does, but I am saying it's what the Supreme Court said. So, um, uh, in, in, and so this could be seen as dicta. So the first thing on data versus speech is the court in the case was very concerned because the law limited marketing because it imposed a speaker and content-based burden on protected expression. Well, pretty much every privacy law limiting marketing does that. The speaker in this law were the pharmaceutical marketers who wanted to be able to send marketing stuff to doctors based on what the doctors had prescribed to all their patients. And what was the content? The content is the data about the patient prescription. Well, every privacy law, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Graham Lee Spiley HIPAA, picks out speakers, picks out content, and does that. So now we're going to have this, if these words mean this, uh, uh, in step two. If we have step one, then the court says that justifies application of heightened scrutiny, which for those of you who've been around the First Amendment means either strict scrutiny, compelling straight interest, or um, the commercial speech level of substantial state interest, and we're going to have a pretty strict test. So if there's a broad reading, here's an example of what we've already seen in the lower courts. There was a case filed that the Fair Credit Reporting Act is unconstitutional. That's the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1970 is unconstitutional because it limits speech by limiting data. And the FCRA has long had a rule that prohibits reporting of credit data over seven years old. Among other reasons, you don't, might not have records to dispute whether Macy's got you wrong nine years ago. So you don't use old data for that reason. Now, this FCRA rule has been challenged in federal courts, in district court right now. It's speaker-based. We're limiting credit reporting agencies. It's content-based. They can't reveal the nine-year-old data. Exactly the structure of IMS versus Sorrell, given the words in the court opinion. What are the implications <coughs> of heightened scrutiny? Well, heightened scrutiny means there has to be a really big deal state interest, a compelling or substantial state interest. The opinion discusses privacy, though there's an argument about whether there's really privacy there. But it emphasizes in a whole series of sentences and languages the benefits of pharmaceutical marketing. So there's a sort of skepticism about a contrary state interest. It has to be narrowly tailored. The state interest um, uh, it, uh, has to be really precise. The judge's job is to strike down any extra limits on data that burden uh, 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 this marketing. And it's a burden of proof on the state to create a record. So if the legislators want to go out and create some limit on marketing for your bank records or something, they have to show that they didn't do anything extra, that it was least restrictive alternative, narrowly tailored. And um, you know, so who comes under these speaker and content limits? I've already suggested this. The speakers could be all the folks who are currently regulated, hospitals under HIPAA, banks under GLB, telecoms under all those laws, and there's content records. Content records stop disclosure of psychiatric records, data about what kind of syndromes you have, credit card records, what you bought, to from information, et cetera. So just taking the structure of, of heightened scrutiny, uh, we at least have big doubts about pretty much all the US privacy laws that affect marketing. Uh, and so what's the role of economics? So if we get this broad reading. Again, I'm not saying that the court will do it. I'm saying it's what the court said and didn't give distinctions. So we might get economists to document that there's a compelling state interest in privacy. So we can have Alessandro have a lifetime supply of being an expert witness saying it's really, really important to have privacy. And then the judge decides that they believe him or they believe Eric Goldman and thinks there's more of an interest in the people having the accurate advertising. We might also have economists try to build the record that there's no extra limits on data, that we just went right to get out of privacy, but we didn't go six inches farther because that would be too much of a limit on speech. But if heightened scrutiny is really applied, then a wide range of speaker and content-based limits are subject to serious attack. We know how to write the brief today. Okay, I did a blank slide here. That's how it reads. Go home and read IMS versus Sorrell. I, I think you'll see that these are the words. What can be said back? Here's one slide of some, some initial thoughts on what could be said back. So one job for lawyers is to do distinctions. That was that case, the next case is something different. Sorrell, we could argue, is not a privacy case. It was about the information for doctor's activities. The doctor prescribed this medication or that medication. That's a corporation's activities. We could take the view that privacy is about individuals, which, by the way, is what most of uh, you know, privacy law is about. 
Now, the court used the word privacy about 100 times, so maybe they didn't see the distinction. But maybe in the next case, we can say it's really about people. We could say that the, the uh, Vermont law was just a dumb statute, which I think it was. It was like some doctor didn't want to have the pharma people calling him up. And <coughs> so this was just a classic commercial speech case. It was an easy case for the court, and they didn't really need it. We could say that data uh, uh, equals speech means that uh, we're going to have a parade of horribles. So now it's going to be unconstitutional to limit doctors who want to sell their patient records. It's going to be unconstitutional to limit doc lawyers selling data about their clients unconstitutional limit phone companies sending out a list of my phone calls to everybody I've called. Um, the court suggested that HIPAA is still okay. Uh, they said HIPAA is different because there's only a few narrow disclosures under HIPAA. Now, I was one of the main people who wrote HIPAA. There's a lot of disclosures under HIPAA. <laughs> there, you know, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations to begin with. That's a lot of stuff. I think the court didn't know what they're doing. So the structure of the, of, the, of the Sorrell case and the structure of HIPAA are much more similar than the court recognized. And then maybe, and this, is, this does echo Eugene Volokh, the state can do consumer law to regulate the contract between the bank and the consumer, the lawyer and the consumer. And you can basically have some consumer protection conditions to protect privacy and downstream use. There are, there are doctrinal ways to push back at the broad reading. But the words in the Supreme Court's decision suggests that finding market failures simply won't work if the court applies what they said in the Thank you, Peter. Let me get some reactions for the panel. Bar Baron, do you uh, share so, Peter's interpretation? So I filed uh, both at the Supreme Court and at the lower court, uh, and I'm proud to say that we won. Um, and we won on the, the basic principle that the data involved here is speech, uh, and that that you know, can, cannot escape scrutiny. Um, now, the court didn't resolve a lot of other questions, uh, and frankly, I think they, um, uh, they uh, in some sense, I would like to have gone, to have seen them gone further uh, in saying that um, the reason why this uh, needs to uh, be subject to strict scrutiny has to do with the fundamental inseparability of commercial and non-commercial data in that particular case. But be that as it may, I, I think the, the important thing to recognize here is what the court is going to do in the line of cases that will develop out of this is bring some analytical rigor to legislating about privacy, because quite frankly, the Vermont uh, statute is just the tip of the iceberg of bad legislation. And what I mean by that is uh, failure to identify a clear harm, right? And, and, and I don't by that necessarily mean an economic harm, but I mean to say a real problem that, is, that can only be remedied by government, a failure to narrowly tailor remedies, and a failure to look at less restrictive alternatives. So I, I, I don't think, you don't have to be a privacy skeptic to think that this could actually be a good thing for getting people to think more carefully about privacy. And indeed, I think, Peter, your sl slides in there about the role that economists could play here, I think you're exactly right, that we could actually have some rigor brought into this uh, analysis. But having said all that, even under strict scrutiny, I, I don't think uh, that the sky is going to fall. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, a lot of the particular examples that you've mentioned here, like lawyers selling data about their clients, that's a radically different situation from the situation of Sorrell where the data involved was patient de-identified, and nobody was contesting that it could be, um, or at least the court didn't. Uh, didn't. Go ahead on that. Okay, maybe. well, let's, okay, so let's, 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 let's at least accept that that's a different case from lawyers selling data about their particular clients. My point is simply to say that um, we need to be very careful to separate the discussion about standards from the discussion about an outcome in a particular case. And just because we are now in uh, First Amendment land and regardless of whatever that level of scrutiny might be, doesn't mean that we're going to throw out all of these existing privacy statutes. Some of them, perhaps, and that might be a good thing. But what I think uh, this is uh, going to be good for is giving us a clear map for seeing how we legislate wisely on privacy in the future and why we should look to, uh, why our policy framework should be one of looking to less restrictive alternatives that gets back to what I was saying earlier about trying to build a more effective um, quasi-common law. And I have to say here, I actually, you might be surprised to hear, I actually agree with Chris that there are real problems today in, for example, how language is used in privacy policies. And I don't see any reason conceptually why that can't be resolved under the existing framework of uh, <coughs> analyzing what is unfair or deceptive. So, Peter, do you want to quickly clarify something? Well, it, you know, Barron said he wants strict scrutiny for these laws. And what I was taught is strict scrutiny is invariably fatal. So that's really what I said. Yeah, well, I think that's a mistake. I mean, no, 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 well, I, that's I fine. That, that right. happens to be a Supreme Court doctrine, but you think that they're wrong on that, too. The thing is, once you get up to that level of scrutiny, 
there's so much contested facts about effects on individuals that a judge who feels that they're going to follow the strict scrutiny is going to have a very hard time upholding the law. There's consequences to words. Putting strict scrutiny on HIPAA really puts HIPAA into doubt if you go down through the checklist of what we saw in Sorrell. Okay, Chris, do you want to uh, uh, respond? I've got a lot of thoughts. I'll try to get them out. Um, you know, Sorrell involved a dumb law, but the problem is, is that most privacy laws are dumb. It, and they, they often make no sense. And if you want to figure out why, go work one. Go to a state legislature and work a privacy law. Look at the, uh, at the uh, lobbyists who come out against it, and they will make it dumb. They will make it make no sense in order to kill it in the process. And then what comes out of the process is something that's never rational, something that would never survive strict scrutiny. Um, but with that said, I think it was particularly dumb because online advertising, I think is just, I think it's kind of silly. Um, this type of advertising is awesome. It meant that cheerleaders came to your office. Um, I wouldn't want to stop that advertising. Um, <laughs> that's a good reason to keep it around. Um, but with that, all that said, I think there's a reason why libertarians should hate this decision. And I'd love, Baron, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Because this, this involved a forced government collection of information that was later revealed to the private sector. And it seems to me that that's, that's like the hallmark of, of what is dangerous in our world. When the government compels you to provide truthful data, let's say your driver's license information, your tax information, et cetera, but then the private sector gets a bite at it. And if you say, you know, private sector, you can't have a bite at it, it violates the First Amendment. And then I have one more question for you. Um, and I think Peter might have some um, response too. What does Sorrell say to your, to your proposal to have more vigorous disclosures, so which are forced disclosures? that pertain to specific speakers about specific topics. Right. Does it have any application? Uh, so let me take the second question. The answer is no. And the reason is that um, we're, when, we're, when we're talking about compelled disclosure, um, we're in a different realm of uh, First Amendment scrutiny. Uh, and what I mean by that specifically is I, I don't see any reason why this, this decision or any other decision limits the government's ability to say to somebody, assuming that there is some actual justification for doing so, that um, you have to, you know, you have to disclose your, just as we have with nutrition labeling today, what are the facts about how you do this? What are your data practices? And look, for example, let me give you, let's set aside P3P, look at the uh, context of financial regulation. There is right now, I think this has passed, um, uh, Chairman um, ISA has put forward a proposal to take the existing uh, regime of SEC financial disclosures and say to all those companies, okay, all this data that you're providing, uh, you have to fill out these forms every year, you are now going to be required to put that information in extensible business readout language, which is akin to XML, right? I have no problem with that, and I don't think the First Amendment does either. And so what I'm saying there is that uh, as long as you're compelling factual disclosures and you are not putting a company in a position of having to put a round peg into a square hole, that is to say, you know, well, we're not really sure how this, how this fits in here, but we'll sort of, we'll squeeze it in here, and this doesn't actually accurately describe what we're doing. If you give them a robust framework for describing what they're doing, you can compel their disclosure. I don't think Sorrell has any bearing on that. As to your first question, um, uh, so it, it's a fair question. It's something that was at the heart of our brief. And the short answer is I, I would very much agree with you if we were talking about data that would not be um, collected absent the government mandate. In this particular case, if you, if you, and I've talked to people in the industry about this, at the heart of our brief was the proposition that the data that was being collected here was going to be collected anyway for commercial purposes. So what I don't want is to get into it, and which is very different from a normal situation where government, for example, in data retention, uh, compels ISPs to retain logs of everybody who accesses the internet, right? We have opposed those mandates. Um, that's very different from saying, you have to collect all this information about your, um, doctor's uh, prescription patterns, which you are going to collect anyway, right? The industry uses that data for lots of other beneficial purposes. So if, if we were to take your argument uh, to say that that, that then becomes uh, unconscionable because there is a government mandate here, you would end up banning a practice that in fact is desired by the private sector. I mean, in other words, the government mandate here is superfluous. So, um, so we've heard mainly the viewpoints from uh, academia and the nonprofit sector, but I'm interested in hearing uh, from Fernando, uh, representative from the private sector, Time Warner, um, your view of either upcoming 
uh, regulatory challenges, whether it's the Sorrell decision or proposed changes to the uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act or uh, emerging technologies, how you might deal with those challenges. Thank, uh, thank you, Harry. Um, in listening to the debate, uh, I'm more convinced um, uh, than I was at the beginning of my view coming into this when I talked to Peter about it, which is um, I think it's, a, it's actually a useful case for the wrong reasons. Um, that is, I think it's useful for policymakers to think about the consequences of regulating data um, from the perspective of, of business. Um, so I'm not going to speak to it as a lawyer. I'm going to speak to it in terms of policy. I think that um, clearly there are First Amendment implications. And I think here, reading the case, um, what I got was a sense of distaste with the legislation, as Peter pointed out. Um, it seemed rather um, inartfully drafted and, and awkwardly defended. And so I think that there's a lot of that going on in the case. Um, but I think what I take away from it is more hopeful than Peter and, and um, I guess perhaps not as broad of a perspective as what Barron is taking, which is I think it's uh, a reinforcement that policymakers have a role in privacy regulation, um, but done so in a way that is not targeting speech, certainly not viewpoint um, uh, regulation as the court, I think, believed was the case in Sorrell, um, but in a way that is uh, balancing important interests. So I'm not sure that it's about strict scrutiny, Peter. I think it's much more about having a um, clearly targeted regulation that does not overly burden speech, and data is speech information. I think there were some, some quotes in the case that I found very persuasive. It's all dicta. But I thought it was very important to get out into public uh, debate about the importance of information and information dissemination and creation of information being speech. Um, and I think that that matters. And that leads to a point I wanted to make about the earlier discussion we were having about technology. And kudos to Scott for putting up those slides because that was great. Um, uh, it was dizzying in a way. From my perspective, um, the thing about that is, it's all great, it's all, it's all cool, it's all neat. Um, very little of it is real, certainly today, in, in the sense of mass market real. Um, it's going to be real, but it's distracting to think about it in terms of policy because I think that leads to uh, regulating by technology and regulating by um, you know, what we might be afraid of. You know, look at those goggles or, you know, look at that uh, thumb drive or look at that iris scanner. And I think that that's a challenge that policymakers have always had. You know, the car comes along, you know, and you start thinking about, well, what about the horse and buggy in the car? Cable television comes along, and as Joe was pointing out, it may be, it may, I'm going to twist your words a little bit, enhance uh, welfare to have all more choices available, but it, it may be, it may stand in front of other models that are thought of as being superior at the time for other reasons and comfortable over the air broadcast. But my point is um, technology shouldn't be the focus of regulation. It shouldn't be the focus of policy. We should be thinking about, even though we're more distracted with all of these gadgets, perhaps more distracted than policymakers ever have been, we should be thinking about principles. We should be thinking about parity. And we should be thinking from the perspective of consumers. And I think that goes to, to your fundamental question to me, because that's how I like to think that a smart business is operating. You know, what will our customers understand? Will they be confused? Will they get it? Will they get opt-out? If they, if they opt-out from one website and not, not another website, are they going to blame us? Is that going to be good for the environment, for the marketplace, for the ecosystem, as Joe, Joe pointed out? Confusing consumers. And I think an important aspect to that, to avoiding confusion, is more consistency, parity. And that means closer attention to principles and less of a worry about, you know, how are we going to target that latest device? Well, thank you, Fernando. I think that's a good point that uh, policymakers uh, shouldn't be distracted by the technology as the uh, legislation surrounding the digital audio tape uh, tells us. Uh, I don't think many of us are still 
using bullets and boards. Online yes. bullets and boards. But I want to save some time from questions uh, from the audience. Um, and per our tradition, if there are students out there who want to ask a question, I will throw that out. So, uh, Daryl, right there, uh, please wait for the microphone. All right, um, I just had a question as far as um, people's views on privacy. Like, for people now, or people who are my age and older, you know, they, you know, the views on having your information on the internet are probably slightly different than my little sister's, you know, generation where for all her life she's had digital cameras. All of her life she's been putting pretty much every picture, the music she likes, everything goes onto the internet with her name, with her password, with Facebook, with all these other information and different things. So as that group grows up, how do you think that that's going to affect you know, privacy and the way it's viewed? Yeah, so uh, does anybody on the panel want to and uh, as changing social norms uh, become the regular context, how does that, sh should that change the economics uh, or the way we think about privacy? Scott, did, do you have it? I'll just say, you know, I think we've been, um, we've typically thought, oh, you know, the kids today, they don't care about privacy. And my sense is that's not right. We're starting to see all kinds of different norms getting created. Uh, mm -hmm. You see uh, kids, my kids, I have kids from 9 to 20. Not, not every year. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, my 20-year-old grew up in the, the first wave of MySpace and Facebook. Um, her friend spent as much time taking data off of Facebook and detagging them, untagging themselves as they do anything else. They're very aware of the self-publication um, tasks that they now have, in, you know, have. They're not clear they like it. So I think we're seeing how complex norm generation is and how difficult it is to predict. Um, is, is there some idea, though, that I, I think maybe uh, Daryl was getting at is that as uh, subjective norms change and, uh, you know, maybe um, subjective privacy harms become less as the, the baseline. Is there, is there some idea behind that economically? Yeah, Baron? Yeah, let me just make two points. Uh, first point is I think that the, there's a good news story to be told here about um, publication controls improving and empowering users. And I would point you there to Facebook first offering um, granular controls on, on every piece of content you publish. And now timeline is worried a lot of people, but a lot of people have forgotten the good news story there, which is that you now have an interface that allows you to go back and, and edit the things that you've disclosed in the past much more easily and limit your audiences. So I, I think what we need to do is find usable tools for audience um, specification and for uh, retroactive control. I think that would deal with a lot of those concerns. The second point is norms are changing. And I think that actually what we're seeing is that uh, greater deal, uh, deal of transparency is breaking down a lot of social prejudices. I mean, um, for example, uh, one of the reasons that being gay is not such a big deal anymore is that, you know, people know about it. There's a very, very sad story. In 1986, when Bowers v. Hardwick decision was, was litigated, one of the clerks was uh, one of the teachers at my law school, and he wrote in his memoirs from Justice Powell that Powell was the swing vote in the case. And um, he was trying to decide what to do about it. One of his, he had, he had had, unbeknownst to him, a series of gay clerks, one every year for, for many years. And the gay clerk he had that year uh, was trying to convince him that uh, he needed to, to, to vote to strike down the, the, the uh, sodomy law. And he, in talking to the justice, it became very clear the justice didn't get it. He didn't understand what being gay meant. It, didn't, it had no content to him. And he, and he said, well, I don't, who are these people? I don't know them. Who, who are they? And, he, and the clerk said to him, well, you do know them, you just don't know they're gay. And this, so this tormented him for, for 25 years because he had not had the courage to tell the justice, his boss, that he was gay. And the fact is the world is now a better place because people you know, are actually more open and honest about that. But it doesn't mean that you know, I, as a gay person, don't still want to have those meaningful publication controls just as for any other aspect of my life that I can decide who gets to see a particular piece of content. So the reason that I'm optimistic here is both that I see prejudices breaking down, but also people being able to create their own private spheres in a way that was never possible before. And the, 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 there's this idea that we had more privacy in the past. Like, I, I think a lot of that in, is, is a mirage, because today we actually have the ability to have our, our tailored group of friends where we have common values 
and preferences and sensitivities, and we can share something with them. And the important thing is that we have control over that and that the company is actually trustworthy in keeping and maintaining that data, which I want to grant is a separate set of issues. Does anyone else have a reaction to the changing norms question? Yeah. So, so I can come up with 20 dimensions where we have much less privacy than we did 20 years ago and probably 20 dimensions where we have more control over our data. Um, and when you're in these debates, you, you find people with views that, that then emphasize the ones that go in that direction. Dana Boyd and her co-author, I can't remember her first name, her last name is Marwick, has written extensively on uh, the social networking norms of privacy and they found very complex and very privacy protective behavior by the under 20s that they've interviewed. And so I'd look at Boyd and, and uh, Marwick for, for uh, the most extensive uh, research on this. Okay, yeah. so well, it's, it's, let it's, me just throw yeah, one sure. thing out. The, the uh, Direct Marketing Association has long done these studies that showed that young people didn't care about telemarketing. And part of the argument there was we don't need a do not call list because look, this, this segment of people who are 18 to 24 don't object to telemarketing as much as those who are 24 and older. And they said, well, there's this new cohort of people coming along, don't care about telemarketing, shouldn't have do not call because it will enforce our values, our generation's values on these younger people who don't care. It's one interpretation of the data. Um, but this argument is one that's long made, and I think it, it was directly related to the fact that at the time, most 18 to 24 year olds didn't have their own phone line. So some of, her, so some of this is, uh, some of the data is a little self-serving, uh, or at least interpretations of it. I want to get another question out there, um, in the center there. Okay. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Hi. So one of the, the themes that's been kind of danced around tonight that I'd love for the, the panel to address is this kind of yin and yang between the legal and the social and the, we'll call it the crime and the fear. And I just kind of feel like this lack of clarity when it comes to privacy is actually call it causing a, an enterprise paralysis to make decisions um, as it relates to how do I use all of this data that's coming at me. So, you know, kind of a, a time horizon, a timeline, your, your take on what it's gonna take to try to work through these conflicting issues? That's a really good question. Um, I, I don't want to be the, the person who says, because I don't believe it, um, that uncertainty is something that is bad. Um, I, I don't think that uncertainty is necessarily bad for innovation. I don't think uncertainty is bad for competition. Um, in, in this context, um, it's, it's a complex problem um, because of the scale of innovation, all the things that we've talked about in terms of digital, in terms of technology, in terms of the vast amount of information that's becoming more and more available, how widely popular it is, how compelling all of those applications are, um, and then the overlay of regulation that we you know, have, and then all of the concerns that are voiced sort of social pressure. So from the perspective of you know, a business uh, in the marketplace, I think there, that you look at the legal the environment, you look at the fact that you may be regulated already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you an incumbent? Are you an entrant? What, are, what, what kind of rule would actually lead to a, 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 an innovation as opposed to compliance costs? And that's the difficulty, um, I think. If, there, if there's a rule that leads to innovation and the trade-offs are such that, yes, I have to spend time complying, but I'm able to do something to innovate, then I think that that's positive. That's a positive development. I'm skeptical about how easy it is to get there um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, cap political capture, um, the problems of asynchronous regula regulation, some, some entities like you know, we're regulated in some of our business lines and not in others. And, you know, so it's very complicated to get to that point. And so you have to ask, are, in all of those trade-offs, can you, can you say that eliminating the uncertainty is actually going to bring a benefit in terms of being able to offer more to your customers? And I, I, I don't know the answer to that. 
So let me, let me rephrase this a little bit, your question, which I think is interesting, is a lot of what we've been referring to about privacy in the future, uh, an issue of uncertainty and a failure to properly delineate, uh, delineate um, articulable principles or boundaries, or is this uncertainty serving a beneficial goal either through the inability to articulate boundaries or the uh, flexibility to adapt? Any, any reactions here? Is this uncertainty a problem? So, so the central challenge of economics and, and, and the debate that we've had over the last century is um, planning under uncertainty. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the socialist calculation debate. And um, I'm just curious, how many people here have seen the Keynes versus Hayek rap video? If you haven't seen it, right, it's, it's classic. And I, I, I think it really actually, this is Russ Roberts at George Mason, who hosts Econ Talk and is probably one of the smartest economists uh, in the country, wrote this. And I think he, he, he brilliantly encapsulated exactly this point when he has Hayek say in this sort of uh, rap, he says, uh, I don't want to do nothing, there's plenty to do. The question I ponder is who plans for whom? Do I plan for myself or do I leave it to you? I want plans by the many, not plans by the few. What he was saying here, in paraphrase of Hayek, was central planning, which is where, in, in, in terms, to put this in Demset's terms, government defines a property right and government decides, given technological uncertainty about the future, what the right answer is, such as specifying an opt-in or an opt-out, right? That's different from planning in the private sector, where you leave it to a, a disparate discovery process of a number of actors to figure out how, what the right answer is on any one of these, uh, these, these technologies. And, and, and the key point there is, yes, we need to plan, and yes, we need answers, and yes, we have to protect privacy in some ways, that doesn't necessarily mean we need a one-size-fits-all government solution. Sometimes we might. And so the, the key question I want to leave you with is, the question that the, the Supreme Court is starting to deal with is, not what the right answer is in a particular case, but what the standard for intervention is. And that, I think, is what the privacy world needs to have more clearly. When do we intervene? How good do the existing tools have to be to be preferable to regulation? And you know, what does constitute a, a, a serious harm that justifies government action? I, I, well, well, I, wanna, I just want to uh, thank you for what I believe is the uh, first panelist to quote from an economist rap song in the Silicon Valley. <laughs> so I, flat irons event. I, I have to confess I use that line oh, okay. with some frequency. Yes. It's a great so, line. Um, so Chris, I, I know that you had a... So I, I'm like a lover of newspapers. I actually get paper, you know, uh, subscribe to the New York Times and the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. It's interesting about subscribing to the Wall Street Journal is that you don't get any less targeting or tracking or advertising online when you pay 150 bucks a year for it. And so this, <laughs> I think, leads to some of the uncertainty that you are raising. The question is, is like, how far is this going to go? And how far, how much is enough? My research at Berkeley suggests that it'll never be enough. That, that, that these, the companies that are interested in doing targeted marketing, they started out by saying, oh, we need cookies. Then they realized increasing numbers of people are tossing cookies. So what do you do? You, you, you use a, um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, F FCC, we apologize again. <laughs> so, so what do you do? You do things like what Lori Craner discovered um, you, you, you use technologies to make people take the cookie, or uh, the, the product that I discovered, the, the use of e-tags to track people can't be blocked, or the use of flash cookies uh, to, be, to track people. It's not clear like when that's going to stop, when, and where the cutoff is between uh, targeting and um, respect for individuals. And I, I mean, I push back, Baron, on your, on your argument about Hayek. I mean, it's it's not government that's deciding, it's a small group of advertisers who, who don't see people as individuals. They see them as targets and waste. So I want to get and, quick, and quick, quick highly, reactions. Excuse me, they're highly paternalistic. I, you talk, I asked, is talking about okay. the FTC being paternalistic? The FTC is trying to give us choices. The people who are working on Do Not Track are trying to give us a choice. The advertisers are making it technically impossible for you to choose. And the media companies are trying to actually run a business. But in the interest of time, let me just get reactions quickly from Peter, and we've got one more minute from Scott. It's great fun to be on a panel with Baron because, I mean, for so many reasons, but he articulates a vision that's centered on Hayek in many ways. And when you if central planning is bad, having the FTC plan all data flows for America is bad. I don't think even Commissioner Brill wants that, right? I mean, I just don't think that's. Uh, on the other hand, Julie, right? 
<laughs> On the other hand, Julie Cohn earlier today did talk, I used to teach banking reg, taught, t told us that the capital levels of banks for, the first, uh, for, for much of the bubble were being set by the banks themselves under models they designed. And that wasn't so great either. You know, really didn't work out very well, the capital level pin. So, of course, too much government's bad. And, of course, having, you know, uh, uh, no limits when there's externalities is bad. So that's going to be a long-term thing, and we're not going to come to some decision on that today. The second thing is to notice that in the broad reading of Sorrell, or in the judges scrutinizing so that we have to have Alessandro testify in 300 cases, the judges, the life-tenured, much older, less technologically savvy judges, will be absolutely governing what sort of data flows happen or don't. And Scott, do you want to have the final word here? Oh, wow. Uh, I was just going to say, I, it, I'm not sure I know what kind of uncertainty we're talking about. And I'm not sure that the uncertainty, and I'm not going to ask you because then you get the last word. Um, I, <laughs> but, but, but I will say, look, what we see is, in the face of whatever uncertainty we're talking about, we see lots and lots and lots of firms pushing forward and doing lots and lots of tracking in all kinds of ways, if we just focus on that again. And they're going to do all kinds of other things, like build massive facial recognition databases and varieties of other things. And they don't seem particularly perturbed by the uncertainty at the moment. And part of the reason is that to the extent we are regulating, one question we also have to be asking is, we're, we are creating safe harbors. And they're putting, so for example, they know right now that as long as they don't track or record PII, as long as they don't write down your name, social security number, and store it forever, they're safer, right? And they can use lesser data security practices than in some of the more rigorous statutes. And so they, they engage in regulatory arbitrage, right? They just look at what they want to accomplish, and they figure out where in the regulatory scheme they can fit their project, and they go for it. And if they don't get found, um, like Carrier IQ this week, um, if they don't get found, uh, we don't have a clue that they're even doing it until Chris, you know, drills in and figures out what they're doing. Um, so I'm not sure that uncertainty is slowing anybody down at the moment. Uh, if anything, uh, they're uh, full sp everybody's sort of full speed ahead building a system they don't really understand. Well, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists here for a great discussion. <laughs> <laughs>